Welcome to Over and Out with Don News. With me is Ahmed Khwaja. I'm Saadi Reza. So today is our semifinal preview and Super 8 review. And it's it, and we uh, talked about this leading up to the Super 8 that we thought it would be a fantastic Super 8. And it, it was a fantastic Super 8. The matches were wonderful. Um, the drama, uh, just everything you could hope for uh, happened. Um Let's go backwards. So let's start off with the last game, the Afghanistan Bangladesh game. Ebbs and flows, high drama at all time. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you have to say that Afghanistan probably deserved to be one of the top four teams left in the tournament. Um, the, this has been a team in the ascendancy for the past few years, um, and a team that's um, you know only started playing. Uh, cricket not too long ago on the international level they were an associate not too long ago but between rashid and uh the brain trust of bravo and trot they deserve a lot of credit for not just uh, reaching the semifinals but in the way they did it beating good teams you know their win against uh um australia beating a tricky bangladesh team yes there was some gamesmanship but that you know at the end of the day you we play to win the game right as as the famous nfl head coach once said play to win the game um your thoughts afghanistan well, absolutely you're spot on there doc because like you mentioned in your pathway to the semi final in the seven matches that you've played you've beaten new zealand you've beaten australia for the very first time in your history and of course you had to take care of what uh, of a very feisty bangladesh side as well so you absolutely deserve to be right up there in the reckoning and of course like you mentioned in that match a lot of things those once again those one percenters that we always talk about they just went their way especially those back to back wickets that fell to rashid khan that put them ahead of the dls score as well if rain was going to arrive so perhaps that just relaxed them a bit i felt they were a bit frantic i felt they were pushing a bit too hard but then rashid khan those back to back strikes picking up four wickets amazing absolutely amazing win and if you imagine where afghanistan cricket was about around 2010 we used to call them a team of 11 shahid afridis not anymore man not anymore I, we can definitely argue i think most will even agree that they are the second best white ball side in asia right now easily the second best uh, white ball side and this is no fluke this has been coming this has been coming for a while you could see them their their players are are hardened they're savvy they play t20 cricket franchise cricket across the world it's it's deserved and they're they're going to be a tough out for a south africa team that made the semis in 92 in 99 in 07 in 09 in 14 15 and 23 and have yet to make a final this is probably as good a chance as ever but we've said that before with south africa and in this in this run they've sort of exercised demons of the past they've they've uh um they've stopped themselves from choking they've won games on the dls method uh they've won, they've snatched uh, victory from the jaws of defeat they've done everything right the only thing that would have made the circle more perfect was if they were facing australia in the <laughs> in the in the semis but they get they get an afghanistan team and this is a talented south african team they're, again they're tested they have a variety of bowlers they have in the cock they have an explosive batting batting line, lineup this is a good good chance for them to to get to a final of an icc event well like you mentioned doc it's a battle of south africa versus south africa not afghanistan because on paper when you look at the personnel it's a wash for south africa top to bottom they've got the better fast bowling they've got the more explosive explosive and complete batting lineup and they've got pretty good spinners as well of course not at the level of rashid i think noor honestly his reputation has taken a bit of a beating in this world cup he's a very talented bowler but doesn't know quite how to pick up wickets how to set up the batter just yet if the batter makes a mistake goes for a slog or misread some of his googlies then he gets a wicket but if you ask him to bowl six out of six deliveries on a trot consistently i don't think he can do it like rashid khan does so south africa compete very well with them and well one of these teams has got to play a final that's the way the tournament has been set up so let's see is it going to be the afghans is it going to be south africa from my tactical look and point of view i think afghanistan need to bat first again if they bat first 
then they have a chance because they have that cheat code of a bowler in Rashid Khan. You have to automatically subtract his four overs. You will only get 20, 25 runs. And if you're lucky, you will only lose one wicket, not three or four. So can South Africa chase properly against them? And can Afghanistan bat well enough against that power-packed South African bowling? It remains to be seen. It's going to be a very, very exciting semi-final. I was going to bring up this point later on in our discussion, but I'll bring it up now. And that's one of the things that uh, both Afghanistan and India have a massive advantage of. When you have four overs of Rashid and four overs of Bumrah, a chasing team really has to compress their target into about from 20 overs into about 16, 17 overs. Absolutely. And our Steep Singh today had, uh, or yesterday had a wonderful interview where he said one of the reasons he's able to get wickets is because batters know that they have to negotiate four overs of Bumrah. And so then they, they take chances on Arshdeep. And all he has to do is bowl in the right spots. And he gets wickets just from the batters being overly aggressive. And I think that goes for the Indian bowlers. That goes for the Afghani, Afghani bowlers. They have an out uh, an oversized advantage uh, when defending a total. It doesn't matter how low that total is. And, and we saw that in the Pakistan game, whereby although it was a runner ball, we knew at that point, as Pakistan fans, we had two overs of Bumrah to come. Sure enough, those two overs happened and we fell below the run of ball. And the same question, if I ask uh, of uh, our bowling components, who is that one bowler? Or do we have too many of them? We don't know. We don't have that balance. We don't have that defensive bowler. Everybody's looking for wickets. They overcompensate, they bowl foolish lengths, or they try something fancy, and then they get hammered for runs. That is exactly what Gary Kirsten needs to fix in our T20 bowling. The batting, I have given up on, because as per the personnel, we have we have the choices. Who do we bring in? Abdullah Shafiq, Saud Shakil, Sahib Zada Farhan. I mean, that batting is never going to fix itself. We need like a magical player to come through, and we don't have that batting culture yet with intent that can fix that problem. But what we can do is at least get our bowling in the right balance. Maybe see a bowler. We know Shaheen likes to attack. Naseem likes to attack. Haris Rauf is pure attack. Shadab Khan is confused in his mind. Do I look for wickets or I do become a defensive bowler? He's stuck in the middle world, which is he's stuck in purgatory, basically. And he doesn't know which way his career is going. And now he's pretty, pretty much at a crossroads in his entire cricketing career. Am I a bowler? Am I a batter? Where am I going to get success? Where am I going to get overseas franchise franchise deals for what capability, you know? So that is something that we need to uh, rectify in the future if we are to restore our glory in T20. I took a bit of a tangent there, but I hope that is the point I was trying to make, that they have that balance, they have that maturity to know their roles and execute it to a T. No, it's a perfect segue, uh, batting intent to India. Let's come to India and the transformation of Rohit Sharma into Hitman. He played amazing innings, 92 of 41 against Australia, uh, basically took down Mitchell Stark 6-6-4, aggressive, attacking batting. But it's not just to, to play the way Rohit played in that game. It's not just the ability. We know Rohit uh, got the ability, right? He's one of the greatest batters of all time. But it's also the mentality. How many batters on the world stage in that match against that opponent, against that bowler, can say, you know what, I'm going to take this guy on and I'm going to execute. And boy, did he ever. And Rohit Sharma, you could say that the 2023 World Cup uh, final changed when Travis Head uh, uh, got, got that catch uh, uh, of, uh, of Rohit okay. Sharma. And um, in, in many ways, he's the glue for India today, In many much more than Kohli. Kohli, again, got out cheaply. Um, but as Rohit goes, so goes India. He's he's become an absolutely fantastic batter, and I love watching him. Oh, spot on. He's been playing with this intentful role in white ball for a couple of seasons now. His numbers have taken a bit of a dip, but overall, he's always been the one to set that tone for India in the power play. And since he had been struggling in the World Cup, apart from that 50 versus Ireland in the opener for India... That's why their top order batting had fallen into a bit of a slump. Plus, you put in the uh, the difficult wickets as well. And of course, Virat Kohli will be super, super frustrated. A five-fall duck for him. He had been topping the IPL charts for the entire two months, the entire duration of the IPL. But he hasn't been able to translate that form into this World Cup. But 
a great player like him is due and maybe the England Lions who who have a bit of a bowling attack that's not at f- full force it does concede a lot of runs mark wood eventually got himself dropped from the side in that game versus usa so that could be a problem because england do tend to go for runs they've always been uh, backed by the high octane batting lineup but if india bat first if they post a score of about 170 180 i can see england having a bit of a wobble especially on what is supposed to be a turning track in providence guyana Rain track and potentially rain in the forecast as well. Coming back to uh, Rohit, uh, one other thing was when I was watching watching him, I couldn't help but think how many innings, and this is of course T20, so it's just short short innings. How many such innings has a Pakistani batter batted recently like that? You can think of Fakhar in the 2017 Champions Trophy, Afridi, some of those um, centuries he scored against India. but that level of elite mentality aggressive intent and execution you just you i can't even imagine babar going out there and playing that way or rizwan going out there and playing that way and actually uh, um executing that style of cricket it's it was just it was amazing to watch doc the problem the thing is that rohit sharma made his name as an indian player as a t20 player if you remember He was in yes. the 2007 T20 World Cup at number five, number six. He played a quick fire cameo that posted that score alongside Gautam Gambhir. So he's always had that DNA of a flash player, especially in the power play. I don't see that DNA in Babar Azam. He's a technically sound batter. He knows he has to play for hundreds. That's the way the old school training method of batting. And Rizwan, well, he's pretty much a refurbished player because he was a wicket keeper who had to force to open and stack up the runs and force his way into the side. Otherwise, he didn't have a sniff in the time of Sir Faraz Ahmed, if you remember clearly. So I think when your base it doesn't have that attacking nature, like it's not ingrained in you. i think it's very very difficult to just establish that and inculcate it into your technique we've seen virat kohli try to do that he has batted with a lot of intent in the last 18 months or so but certainly it doesn't feel like it's coming natural to him in this world cup and maybe babar can turn his game around but i seriously doubt that he can make such a market improvement and go to that strike rate of 140 plus that is so natural for the likes of travis head or david warner josh butler or like you mentioned Rohit Sharma. Of course David Warner is now retired. Before we uh touch on the England cricket team, I'll give you one analogy um using the England football team. So, <laughs> uh, a decrepit performance in the Euros. And I was talking to somebody and I was telling them that if if it's one or two players out of form, you can replace those one or two players. But if it's seven to eight players, then it's the system that's lacking. 100%. And that's what's wrong with and that's what's wrong with Pakistan's batting. It's not one or two players who are out of form. It's the entire construct of your batting system that's that's wrong, and that needs to be completely retooled and reworked. Well, absolutely. Like like we've discussed on our private chats, uh, we took five openers to this World Cup. So we wanted Fakhar to bat at four. We wanted him to bat at three. We wanted Usman to bat at six. So it was just a hodgepodge and a very confused strategy. Okay, I understand that these were the higher strike rate batters, but you also have to remember the bat in the top three in the PSL, which are very flat batting wickets. The the Pindi Stadium wicket is basically made of cement at this stage. So of course they're going to pile on the runs, but that's not how the way to compile your squad. Look at Shivam Dubey's role for Team India. Look at Liam Livingston's role for England. Look at Marcus Stoinis or Glenn Maxwell roles in Australia, and even Mohammad Nabi's role in Afghanistan. or gulbadi naib who came out of absolutely nowhere and has been the man with the golden arm and he might even end up with an academy award by next year by the way he took that shot to the hamstring and went down so it just shows that horses for courses you cannot force something into a role which they're not familiar to pakistan despite knowing that they tried to do that for the last 18 months the writing was on the wall the t20 performances were uh, were really really bad in new zealand when new zealand came over in england as well but we didn't heed that advice we just took to what we knew we just took to the 15 we wanted right from the onset and then of course we paid the ultimate price by getting humiliated in the world cup i mean new zealand cricket uh, it's a double edged sword um having so much exposure to the ipl because yes they know the indian players but the indian players know them too moin 
and Adil Rashid are not strangers to the Indian batters. Um, I, I think if they were playing a different lineup, they could be sort of these wild card bowlers uh, to put in eight overs. Um, so that's the, to me, that's the key matchup there is how well do Adil Rashid and Moin Ali sort of play against India. I think England has a chance, um, but I think some of that depends on the toss and weather related conditions. Um, and I think whether they chase or they bat first to have an equal shot, uh, it just depends on how, if they're chasing, it, you have to factor in Bumrah. You just, you know, this, England doesn't have a Bumrah factor. Uh, the way India does. Um, either way, I do think that the way the ICC has set this up, um, sort of putting their thumb on the scale, having the team in Guyana, there's reports about how uh, there's not enough hotels uh, in in Guyana for the for England fans and the other. Um, that that just adds to a little bit of spice, and maybe England will want, as defending champions, want to stick it to to Team India and, and the BCCI. Um, either way, it wouldn't surprise me if England won. This is, they're, they're a well-tested, mentally tough team. Well, they're defending champions and they've only improved their team by, of course, they lost Ben Stokes and they've lost Alex Hales, but they just improved their team even more, getting the likes of Will Jacks coming into the side. And, of course, we've had Liam Livingston and Phil Salt has really blossomed as an opener as well. So I feel... India, I think they need to bat first. They need to force uh, England to chase because we've seen England have been a bit rocky when it comes to chasing. And of course, in that chase, if you get the likes of uh, Josh Butler early, then that puts a lot of pressure on that middle order. Even though they've been in good touch, Harry Brook and Johnny Bairstow have been playing well. But the four overs of Bumrah plus the scoreboard pressure, I think if India bat first, get about 150, 160, they're definitely in the game. And England, we saw the way they faltered against South Africa they will certainly will be vulnerable in the second innings. Your semi-final prediction? <laughs> uh, England, South Africa. I I agree, actually. Um, I was going to say the same thing. I agree. It'll be, I think it'll be England, South Africa. Honestly, I want South Africa to get the first ever ICC title. It might re- unleash a monster that could dominate cricket for the next 10 years. But the pain they've suffered over the last 25 years now, Doc, it's been... 25 years since that um, what happened in 1999 I think they've had enough pain and misery they deserve some happiness as well and even further if you go back to 92 where they needed 20 odd runs off one ball <laughs> yeah. it's been so long that uh, and of course the, the founder of uh, that DLS system Professor has passed away Duckworth season, so yes passed rest away in peace sir you've given well. us a lot of drama over the last years I know uh, I think South Africa winning a T20 World Cup would be an amazing story uh, for all the heartbreaks that their fans have had to endure Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Izzy. We'll do it again soon. Oh, absolutely.